would ask you to take your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and that's where we'll begin our study. And while you're turning there, I will just uh, add my words of welcome to those that you've already heard this evening and appreciation for the presence of each one that is here. Matthew chapter 28, and once you're there, we'll begin reading together. We'll read the first 10 verses of Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came upon him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. You know, when you read a passage like that, I think reading about the resurrection is exciting. Uh, it's exhilarating, and uh, I think just reading about the resurrection, thinking about the resurrection kind of stirs our spirit, or hope it does. Uh, you know why that's the case? I think it's because the, the resurrection is exciting. The resurrection is exhilarating, and the resurrection ought to stir our spirit. And I think we see that it does uh, for the women here in the passage that we just read together. A couple things I think are interesting there in this little exchange that we just read Together, I love how, you know, verse 7, the angel gives them some instructions. Go quickly and tell his disciples. I think it's neat how often in the Bible you get a command in one verse, and then in the very next verse you get the obedience to that command using the same exact language. This, that they did exactly what they were told. That's, that's what verse 8 tells us they did. They, they departed quickly from the tomb, we're told. But notice they departed with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And it's about three of the words in that sentence there kind of struck me as interesting. I'm thinking about the setting here. The, the word fear is interesting to me. Because to us, we hear that word in English, it can carry the meaning either of terror or it can mean reverence. You know, I think it's funny that we tend to be people who like an either or. You know, we, we want it to be one or the other. And oftentimes in a Bible passage, we'll, we'll have debates. Well, does it mean fear? Terror here, or does it mean reverence? And what I would suggest to you is, I think it's so often the case in Bible discussions, the answer is usually both. And I think it's a blend here, a little bit of both is being referred to here. I think particularly that's the best way to view it when it's combined with the great joy, it says they simultaneously felt there. Now there's a little nuance meaning to that word there. When it says great joy, it's not your generic garden variety joy that's being described there, but scholars say that word reveals an awareness of God's grace. So if you think about them, they're fearful and they're running, but they're smiling as they think about that demonstration of God's grace. And then frankly, the third word there that I find interesting is ran. And you may think, well, I don't know what he can say about that word. It's pretty self-evident. We know what it means, but I think you do know what it means here in this instance. Because if you tease out the definition of the exact word here that's translated ran, it means, literally means running wide open. Right? So I don't know what mental image you had of these women listening to what the angels said then scurrying off to see the apostles, but they weren't jogging. They weren't trotting. They weren't walking quickly. They were running wide open to get to the apostles with their information they had. I want to suggest to you that little portrait there I think fits with what we know about the women who followed Jesus. And I don't know if you've thought about this before, but a very conspicuous detail, not only in Matthew's account here, but each account of the resurrection is the prominent role that women played in the most important event in human history. And I want to suggest to you that it's particularly striking when you realize the extent to which women were marginalized in first century Jewish society. 
And if you don't realize the extent to which that was the case, I'm going to give you an example. In uh, Jewish rabbinic writings, when the rabbis would write really uh, laws about the laws or rules about the rules and explain the old law a lot, in their writings, when rules were prescribed, rabbis regularly used a common category of women, slaves, and minors. And this common category, uh, the Oxford Journal says, was a way of describing the other from which free male Israelites distinguished themselves. So that's just an example of, of how marginalized women were in, in first century Jewish culture. But let me suggest this to you, maybe particularly ladies, but before you react to that, react to this, uh, Jesus didn't treat women that way. Instead, he esteemed them highly and treated them as God had originally intended women to be treated from creation. But when you consider the historical context, then it is remarkable what an important role that women played throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus, really. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that there are lessons for all of us. And I want to stress that, fellas. All of us, not just the ladies in the audience. But for all the men here, the, the preachers here, the elders here, there are lessons for all of us to learn from the women who followed Jesus. And that's what we're going to do this evening. And when we say that, we're talking about the women who were traveling with him. Turn over to, to Luke chapter 8, if you would, over in the, the Gospel of Luke. And the context here, when we get to Luke chapter 8, uh, really kind of underscores the ideas we've talked about already, because Jesus has just forgiven a woman. He's just forgiven the woman taken in sin. The, you may recall the woman who washed his feet with her tears and anointed him with oil is what's happened in, in chapter 7. And then we get to Luke chapter 8. And we read, uh, soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. And we, as we read this, it's one of those very succinct Bible accounts, but it's really a, it's not detailed, but it's a thorough account of a thorough journey. In fact, if you're reading the New King James this evening, it actually says they went through every city and village on this journey that we're talked about here. And what we're told they were doing here is proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. Proclaiming and bringing carries with it the idea of announcing and instructing. They were telling people about it and then teaching them about it. Uh, but I think sometimes when we think about the earthly ministry of Jesus, our mind goes to visual images of great gatherings like the one we talked about yesterday, the, the feeding of the 5,000 or the, the feeding of the 4,000, or, or maybe we imagine the Sermon on the Mount being preached to a large crowd, but this is the opposite of that. This is Jesus and his followers working village to village and, and meeting in small groups. Uh, having conversations where they can, whether it's in the, the synagogues of these towns or along the street, on the street corner, or maybe even in the private residences and homes of citizens of these villages and towns. And while they were going around and doing that, these women were with him. And I want you to notice here in our, in our reading that they're mentioned with the twelve. You, you think you're done with uh, verse 1 there, then verse 2 ties the women in together with that. Group. But I want you to think how important that is. Think about what you think about the 12. I mean, that's Jesus' closest associates, right? They have their own song, right? I mean, if you're like me and you try to name the apostles, you can't do that without singing, Jesus called them. I mean, these guys have their own song. They're important, right? And when you yourself, when you think of it, who can I think of that was Jesus' closest associates? Who is it that believed in him from early on, who sacrificed for Jesus, who are actual witnesses of Jesus and his work? You think, oh, well, it's the 12, and it is, it's the 12, but it's also these women. Do you see that? I think maybe if you hadn't thought about that before, I don't know how many here are watchers of the, the TV series The Chosen. I don't know if you, if you watch that or what you think about it, but if nothing else, I will suggest this to you. If you do watch that, it does help you visualize and realize that that company of people traveling with Jesus wasn't just him and the twelve. There were more people with them and more things being done, and there was more to that. It kind of humanizes the whole story, I think, if nothing else. And we get the names of some of the women mentioned here. we got 
Mary Magdalene, which simply is a location name, tells us she's Mary from the village of Magdala. You may have always wondered why it decides to tell us that she had seven demons going out from her. I, I think maybe, possibly, my guess would be, you know, the significance of the number seven to, to a Jewish audience, the idea of thoroughness or completeness. You know, that Jesus one time, uh, Peter thinks if I forgive somebody seven times, that's really good. And Jesus turns that on him. Well, maybe it's just a way of saying that she was completely overpowered by demons, but through Jesus she was completely healed. That may be the point there. It mentions a lady named Joanna. And, and Luke here just says, talks about, mentions her husband's position vis-a-vis -vis Herod. And he doesn't even specify what Herod he's talking about. I think that gives us the expectation. He thought his audience would know who he was talking about. But if their timeline is right, he's talking about Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who at that time was the ruler of Galilee. And what we learn about Joanna here is we're told about her husband's position. And I think the purpose of that is just to make it clear to us that she was a, would have been a woman whose husband's employment would have afforded him great wealth. And access to wealth and the, those kind of things. I think that's part of the story here. But no less important than those two women are Susanna and the many others that were told that were there with that group. And think about what that means to be traveling with that group. That was the traveling. That was the, the ministering or serving. The feeding. Uh, basically, they were hiking and camping every day. And it probably the first thing that went some, through some of your minds is, well, I kind of like to hike at camp. Well, I know you do like, but you wouldn't do that every day for three years, would you? You know, you know, usually that first day kind of stinks. You got to pack everything in, set up camp, and then the rest of it's fun for through, for a week at the most. But this is what they did every day for three years: the tr labors of setting up camp, tearing down camp, getting camp set up, going to the closest town, and finding something to prepare for the, this group of travelers to eat. So it would have been very difficult, and I think to think about it that way is good. You know, I was reading a commentary on this passage, and, and the way scholars sometimes do, this, it's a, an understatement that is almost humorous. W one scholar was trying to attempt to describe the, this day-to-day -day life of this little traveling party around modern-day Palestine. And you think about how arduous the traveling would have been and everything we've just talked about. And here's what the scholar said. <clears throat> this is a quote. It was not an easy life. I thought, well, that's good. I'm glad I read that book to, <laughs> to help me understand exactly what they meant. But here these women were with the 12. And I think that is significant for us. And again, we've already seen they provided for them from their own means. They provided and funded this little traveling camp through their own money, uh, their own personal wealth, their own blessings that they had received in this life, and their own labor which sometimes would be the only resource someone has, but whatever they had, they were devoting it to this cause. They provided financial support, and they provided substance for this group, and again, would have taken care of the bulk of the logistics for the journey daily, without weekends or days off. I think it's interesting. But the, the idea then that comes from that is that these ladies were totally committed to the cause, right? There's nothing, there's no other way to describe that. They were totally committed to helping the cause of Christ. And this is one of those places where I, I think, I hope, are you all familiar with the difference between committed and involved? Has everyone heard that explained well? Uh, here's my favorite way to explain it. You may have already heard this. The best way to understand the difference between committed and involved is to think about breakfast. So when you sit down to breakfast, a chicken was involved, but that pig is committed, right? Right? That, that is the difference between being involved and being committed. These women were committed. Involved is something that we as Americans find very easy to do. You know, we're blessed at a time. Involved can sometimes, I'll show some support. I might even write a check and take care of it, put some money toward it. And that's good. That, I'm not saying that's not good. But beyond that level of being involved, these women were committed. And I think there's a lesson for us in that. And maybe the first thing you think of is well, why. Why that level of commitment to the cause of Christ? And I want to suggest you look back up at verse 2 and what it says Jesus had done for these women. And I want to suggest it's simply gratitude for what Jesus had done for them. That because of that, they become faithful followers. 
that because of what Jesus had done for them, they've responded with thankful service, let me suggest to you, that becomes a lesson for us all. Gratitude is shown through thankful service. And I think if, if you have gratitude for what Jesus has done for you, then your response will be thankful service. I want to suggest to you that we learn that lesson from these women who followed Jesus. I suggest, secondly, that these women were his spiritual family. Uh, turn back to, to Matthew chapter 12, if you would, to, to see the, the instance we're going to talk about here. Matthew 12, and this is a, an instance that, again, I think is relatively familiar to most of us. And we'll start reading in verse 46 there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, beginning. <clears throat> It says, while he was still speaking to the people, speaking of Jesus here, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So as you visualize this picture, Jesus is speaking to a crowd. He's either maybe in a uh, street corner, maybe in a residence, and just on the outside of the crowd or just outside of the house there, his physical family comes up and, and wants to speak to him while he's there teaching people. And if nothing else, I want you to see there's a lesson here for us in this, and Jesus' response when he got that news Ultimately, spiritual relationships surpass physical relationships. And I got to tell you, I know a lot of Christians struggle with that. And as a culture and as a group of people, we value our physical family so much, and we should, and that's important. And, and what a blessing it is when your physical relationships and your spiritual relationships can overlap and be the same people and have the same level of involvement. But let me suggest to you, I think a lesson we learn here is that ultimately spiritual relationships surpass physical relationships. But look how Jesus answers it. He answers it with a rhetorical question. Who is my brother and sister? Who are my mother and my brothers? And you notice as he's answering that question, we're told there he's stretching out his hands toward his disciples. And what I suggest to you here is that those women were among his disciples. Notice the wording of your Bible. It does not say he stretched forth his hand toward the apostles. So it's not, I think, best to understand this as restricted to the twelve. He's stretching toward his hand toward those who were sitting and listening to him, those who were among the believers, those who were among his followers, and maybe particularly those who had traveled with him. I think that included the women who followed Jesus. And here's a sentence a few years ago I never thought I might have said in a sermon, but I think the gender-inclusive language proves that. I mean, look at verses 49 and 50, how he mentions uh, who are my mother and my brothers, and he's going to talk about brothers, sisters, and mothers. Now, can you imagine if he puts his hand out and he's just pointing at Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and he said, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? That would have been kind of awkward, wouldn't it? Those roughneck old fishermen from Galilee looked around at each other trying to decide who the sister was and who the mother was. So I just don't think it's the only the 12 he's talking about there. And I think context helps make that clear. And what that teaches us then is that anyone can be part of Jesus' spiritual family. I think that's important. Maybe we're often we make the point there are no eth ethnical restrictions, no ethnic restrictions, but there are no gender restrictions. There are no distinctions between those who are part of Christ's family. And that's an important lesson. But we also learn here that they are his spiritual family because they're doing the will of the Father. I look closer at verse 50 again. That's what he says. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And as you contemplate what that means to do the will of the Father, let me suggest maybe a little help comes from Luke's account of this same conversation. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 21 has Jesus say it this way, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. That was Jesus' definition of his spiritual family. 
Did you catch both of those? Hear and do. Is that our attitude? I mean, you're here tonight. That certainly in, demonstrates an interest in hearing the Word of God. But as you cultivate a desire to hear, are you also in your own life and in your own heart cultivating a willingness to, to do? To do what you hear. I've got to tell you, those are two different things. I can tell you sometimes as an evangelist, as an elder, uh, you have people that will come and ask you things, and, and you want them to. You want to be able to help them as much as you can. But sometimes you find out people are hesitant to ask you things. And sometimes we even say, Christians we even say something like, well, I know all you're going to do is tell me to read my Bible. I say, well, no, that's, that's never true. That's never all I'm going to tell you to do. I say, even when I tell you to do that, I'm not telling you to read your Bible. I'm telling you to read your Bible and do what you find there. You know, read your Bible and then put into practice, put into your heart that word that you find there and put into practice in your life what it is that you read there. To be part of Jesus' spiritual family is to be one who will hear and do. So again, the lesson we learn from these women who follow Jesus is that being included in God's family involves faithful obedience to his commands. And these women teach us. And I think that the power of the word family is, is on display here because ultimately the motivation to do that is relationship. That family relationship ought to become the, the motive for our obedience. We don't just follow rules because we love rules. We follow God's law because we love God. We want to walk with him. And that's a beautiful language. That's really how the Bible describes our relationship with God. You hear people talk about relationship a lot when they talk about Jesus, talk about God. But you know, you won't find it described that way literally in the Bible. What you will find described is, is your walk. Do you walk with him? And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that the women who follow Jesus teach us that. How to be part of his spiritual family. How to be part of God's family. And further, you know, when we talk about these women who follow Jesus, we're really talking about his most devoted followers. T turn to <coughs> Matthew 27, if you would. Back to Matthew 27. We're clo real close to where we begin. And then I'm going to wait a few seconds until I hear the sound of rustling pages cease because I want to ask you to do something for me before we read. Back there in Matthew 27, when we start reading, we'll begin reading of verse 45. But before we read this together, I want you to do something for me. Uh, more so than usual, when we read this passage this time, I really want you to try to imagine yourself there. I really want you to try to visualize uh, what we're going to read about in this passage here. One of the things we're going to talk about is darkness falling over the land in the middle of the day. Uh, nod your head if you were aware of the eclipse that happened back in April of this year, on April 8th. I think, I got the map out, I think in this part of the country you're pretty close to total at one point. For me, I, I didn't see that one as well, Bowling Green, but we got the one back in 2017 was really big. Do you remember how weird it was if you made an effort to go out and experience the eclipse? Do you remember you're out there, if you're like us, you're out with your friends, having fun, a bunch of people from church gathered at one person's house, and we're doing what we normally were together. I'm sure there was some eating going on. But we were hanging out, talking, having fun. Somebody was counting down, and it was supposed to happen. <clears throat> and even though you knew it was happening, when it was sunny and bright in the middle of the day, the next thing you know, it started getting dark. And then the security light kicked on, and that was a little weird. And then you heard the crickets. <laughs> Wasn't that weird in the middle of the day? To make you and you knew it was coming, right? Imagine if that had happened on a day when you didn't know that was coming. And we're in Kentucky here, so it's a little harder. I didn't experience my first earthquake until I moved to California in the early 90s. But I don't know who in the audience here has ever been someplace and experienced an earthquake. Or, uh, in fact, the first one I went through, I, somebody had to tell me the next morning that's what that was. But it woke me up the night before. But I've got to tell you, that's a little, you know, we even use as a metaphor, like the earth moved under my feet, because what we mean is that's a huge deal, right? Well, literally, the earth moving under your feet is a big deal. It gets your attention. It'll throw, you, it'll throw your game off, right? So now, if you haven't been through an earthquake, think about how unsettling it would be to how literally have the ground shake beneath you. 
Now think if you were somewhere sometime and both those things happened about the same time. So as we read this together, I really want you to think about being there and try to put yourself there. But Matthew 27, begin reading in verse 45 with me. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lemak, Sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many of the body of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. I want you to think about these women here. And my suggestion is to you is they were his most devoted followers. Because they had been faithful from beginning to end. Do you see that what verse 55 tells us that introduces these women? They've been following him from Galilee. From the very beginning of his ministry, these women had been with him and following him and serving him. And they followed him every step. Brethren, by the time we get here, they have followed him from Galilee to the cross every step of the way. And let me suggest to you that's unlike his apostles. I look back, maybe just back a page in chapter 26 and verse 56. Chapter 26, verse 56 says, But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then listen to this. Then all the disciples left him and fled. You see that? Men, do you, do you see that? Those disciples were gone. Those faithful women were still there with him at the cross. And what's particularly embarrassing maybe for those disciples is, look back just a little farther in chapter 26 and up at verse 35. That same evening, Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. And then when the time came, they were gone. Now, with the notable exception of John, who we know was at the foot of the cross, and Jesus gave him care for his mother. But the twelve fled. These women were there with him <coughs> to the end. And every possible way would have to observe that they were with him in his darkest hour. No pun intended there. I know up in verse 45, when it talks about the darkness, you could say figuratively, literally they were with him in his darkest hour. But, but I'm talking more importantly figuratively. They're with him there for that trial. They're with him there in the crowd as he's scourged and as he's suffered, as he's mocked. And they were there and watched him die. And they were there for all of that. There's something I think particularly interesting there, again, as he gives us that list of those women, again, in verse 56 that we've seen already a couple times. Notice that verse 56 ends by saying that the mother of the sons of Zebedee was there. It's the mother of the, the sons of thunder. That's the mother of uh, James and John. And do you remember the detail from the Gospels that there was a time when she came to Jesus and she asked him to do her a favor. And she said, what I, what I want is I want one of my sons to be on your left and one of my sons to be on your right when you come in your kingdom. Do you remember that episode? One commentator observed something I thought was very powerful. An ironic connection between what she had said and what she was seeing now. Think about this. 
Jesus had said to her, you don't know what you're asking. Remember that? When she said, I want a son on the right and a son on the left. Jesus said, hey, you don't know what you're asking. Listen to this connection. Now she's standing there at the cross. She imagined her two sons at the right hand and the left of a powerful and glorified Jesus. But now her eyes behold two criminals, one on the right and one on the left of a tormented and shamed Jesus. Now she had a better idea of what serving Jesus was going to look like for her sons, didn't she? I think it's a powerful thing to think about. Now, now she had a better idea of what it was she had been asking. I want you to notice that they didn't give up following Jesus. Again, all the way to the foot of the cross, no matter how bleak it looked, they did not give up following Jesus. Jesus, and let's learn that lesson. Let's be determined to never give up following Jesus, no matter how bad it looks. Now listen, in this life, we need to continue to have sympathy for the suffering. We need to try to encourage and, and hold up the hands of those who are, who are going through difficult times. But when we're going through difficult times, so often the temptation for us is when this life gets hard is to, to move away from Jesus. So often the temptation for us is when this life gets hard to say things like, well, church is hard until we stay away and, and do something else. What I want to suggest to you that the lesson we should learn here is the more this life disappoints us, the closer to God we need to draw. And we see that in these women. I want to suggest to you that from the women who follow Jesus, we learn that when this life is dark, it can be dark sometimes, can't it? And when this life drives you to your knees, and it will, won't it? If you've lived very long, you know it will. Listen, the lesson is this. When life causes you to take a knee Kneel at the cross. And we learn that from the women who followed Jesus. And finally, just be reminded that when we talk about the women who followed Jesus, we're talking about the first witnesses to the resurrection. Go back to, to Luke chapter 23. is the last passage we'll look at this evening. Luke 23, we'll begin in verse 55. But the point here is that these women that follow Jesus from Galilee to the cross now follow him all the way to the graveyard. Now begin reading with me in Luke chapter 23 and in verse 55. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments on the Sabbath day. They rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And I would just pause there to say, in those few verses there, what you see is even after watching him die, these women are still serving. Do you see that? They're still doing what they can do. Even in his death, even when following Jesus seemed hopeless, these women are still serving. They never had stopped. In fact, look at verse 1 of chapter 24. It talks about the spices they had prepared. If you go back up to, to verse 56 of chapter 23, the, the same thing. What you get there is what they could do on the Sabbath and not violate God's law. They did that to prepare to honor him in his death. Let me suggest this makes another point for us as well. They honored the Sabbath day after watching the Lord die. Brethren, they weren't too upset to, and too overwhelmed by life to honor God. And again, I think sometimes we get that way. But they didn't get that way. They had a desire and determination to honor him, even to care for his body, which is, I think, the full, fullest measure of love and respect for someone. Pick up reading with me in verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? 
He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the leaven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. This is interesting when they, they get to the tomb. If you remember maybe from another account, if you're reading Mark's account, one of the things they were talking about on their way to the tomb was, hey, what are we going to do about that big stone? <laughs> they were headed there but didn't know how they were going to move that stone. Or how, but Obviously, you see by the time they got there, that wasn't an issue. But you notice that the, those two men, those angels, say them in verses 6 and 7, he says, they say, remember. I notice that they say to these women, Remember how he told you. Do you see that? He doesn't say, remember how he told the twelve, and you might have overheard, does he? He doesn't say, remember what he told the apostles, and maybe they shared with you later. He says to these women, remember how he told you. And in verse 8, it says, they remembered. And what you, I want you to see here is while they were still serving, and because of that, they now become the apostles to the apostles. You see, that word we have, apostles, the word literally just means one sent forth with orders. That's what the word means. And that's what we just read about here. Those two angels sent those women forth with orders. Go and tell his followers what you've seen. And that's exactly what we see them do here. And listen to this. Have you ever thought about this? Because if you're like me, if last night you were playing Bible Trivial Pursuit and somebody said, oh, here's your question. Who was the first person to preach the gospel? I know a lot of you said, oh, well, Peter, in Acts chapter 2, wouldn't you? Nobody's nodding. I know, I know the truth of that answer. I know the answer, though. They just said that. Why don't you think about this going forward? It wasn't Peter in Acts chapter 2. That these women become the first to tell the gospel story. They go back to the apostles. They went and told, we're told, in verse 10. And in verse 11, where the apostles initially didn't believe them. Look at that. It says, but, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But verse 12, no, they did start to believe them a little bit. Verse 12 says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home <coughs> marveling at what had happened. What I want to suggest to you is these women went and told. And eventually the apostles believed. And then the rest is, is history. Or really, this is one of those times you say the rest is his story. But the point here for the women who followed Jesus is they were the first to see the risen Lord. We read that in Matthew 28 when we began. Think about that. What an honor, what a blessing, what a privilege to be recorded for us for all time as the first witnesses of the resurrection. And don't think they didn't know that. It's not maybe as clear here in Luke's account, but if you read John chapter 20 and verse 18, we're told Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. You know, she didn't go and say, I, I, I've seen your teacher. That's not what she said. She didn't go and find the apostles and say, I, I've seen the, the, the rabbi. I've seen the man you've been following from Galilee. I've seen the carpenter's son. That's not what she said. She came a believer and she said, I have seen the risen Lord. And she knew that. And they knew that. And we know that. The women who followed Jesus. Listen, here's my last hope for us tonight after this study. In addition to all the lessons I think we learned from these women, and I think they're alive, I want you to remember this as well. Their presence in the story is important evidence. 
When I say that, I mean evidence in a very serious and literal way. We talk about evidences or apologetics, right? Reasons to believe the Bible, reasons to believe in the veracity of the gospel story. Their presence is important evidence. It proves the trustworthiness of the Bible. You may say, well, how? How how in the world are you, you arguing that? And here's the reason. Because of Jewish societal views... No one making up a story like the resurrection would rely on the testimony of women. There's this term scholars use in the discussion of apologetics and evidence. It's called the criterion of embarrassment. And if you haven't heard that, really, if you you boil it down, what it says is, is, hey, if you were making up a story, you would you would would not include in that story details that undermine your story. Details that make your story unbelievable or details that make your story embarrassing for you to tell it, would you? And just think, if you were making up a story about you, you would be the hero and you'd be taller and better looking than you are right now, right? When you you make up stories, that's how you make up stories. So the point is, listen, if you were making up a story, you wouldn't include embarrassing details. So the point is this. If the resurrection is not true, if the resurrection is a made-up story, the early church would not have made up a story with women as witnesses. They would have made up a story with the most prominent witnesses you can think of. They'd have had priests seeing the risen Lord. They'd have had members of the Sanhedrin Council. The most respected men in all of Jerusalem would have been the witnesses if this was a made-up story. All I'm saying is this. If this was an untrue story, those who made it up would not rely on the testimony of women. But before you let that observation deflate you, don't let it deflate you. Because think about it. Somebody making up a story like that would not rely on the testimony of women. But God did. And the apostles did. And we still do. Do you see that? And we're so thankful for these women who followed Jesus. Listen, I hope you appreciate some of these great lessons that, again, are for all of us. Uh, if you're paying attention, I hope you don't say, well, that was just for the women. That wasn't just for the women. That was for anyone here who wants to be a follower of Jesus. I think we learned a lot of good lessons here, lessons we all can learn from these women. And I want to review quickly just by asking you some questions that I want you to ask yourself. Here's how simple it is. Does gratitude for what the Lord has done for you prompt you to thankful service? Are you part of his spiritual family? Will you hear and do his will? That's the way you answer that question. Listen, will you follow him to the cross? And then when you get there, will you pick up your cross and follow him? Or how about this? Are you willing to go and tell others about the risen Lord? What I'm asking all of us this evening is this. Will you be like the women who followed Jesus? And if we do anything to help you, let us know now by coming forward while we stand and while we sing.